Hello, welcome to the Russell Moore Show. And I am Ashley Hales, the producer of the Russell Moore Show. And of course, I am here with our host, Russell Moore. And this is one of our episodes that we put out quarterly to talk about what Russell is reading. So I'm excited to talk books again with you, Russell. Always excited to talk books. Yes. So at the end of Russell's newsletter, he always lists what he's reading. And we like to dive a little bit deeper to talk about what we're reading because reading forms our imagination. It can give us a wider perspective. And so we want to bring you these books episodes quarterly. So be sure, of course, to follow along with Russell's newsletter where he writes down what he's reading. And one comment, Russell, that we often get is about the breadth of your reading. So we know you tend to read just kind of wherever your interests and mm -hmm. desires lie. You're not necessarily super methodical, but where do you find the books you read? I'm not methodical at all, uh, really. Okay. <laughs> and I think, I mean, some, some of it is I'm kind of on the lookout for people that I already read or things that I already am interested in. And then one of the things I think that is a real loss when it comes to the, mm. the loss of books is how much serendipity there is of just sort of, huh, that's really uh, interesting. There was a bookstore in where I used to live in Louisville uh, called Carmichael's, uh, and I would go there every week, well, several times a week, actually, and <laughs> just sort of uh, look around and I would always find things, huh, I didn't know this was here. And now with Amazon and everything else, I mean, the yeah. algorithm can kind of tell you things that you'll want to read, but not like that. You know, right. it, it really, it really, if you're not careful, it can narrow you. Mm -hmm. I like to look at, for instance, the New York Review of Books. I find that I mostly get it for the ads because I'm, I'm looking at sort of books that are about to come out. A lot of times from small independent or university presses, and often that's how I find books. Or there's a really good email newsletter from the Inglewood a Review of Books mm -hmm. that comes mm -hmm. out with with things that are. I always check it out because it's books that are coming out this week that might be of interest. I I'm almost always find really interesting things there, and at the beginning of the month, they will put together the Kindle sales books that they nice. think that people would be interested in. And I always, I always look at that and then I end up spending way too much time looking around at the Kindle <laughs> sales books every month. But that's, that's helpful too. Yes. Those are great ideas. You know, I didn't know if you like had the secret underground, right? Sort of text thread with all your really smart well, I do friends. Have, I do have, <laughs> I do have text your threads list. and yeah, there, yeah. there often is a, Hey, here's, here's something that's, coming out or a lot of us blurb books right. for people. And so sometimes we will know, hey, there's something really good coming out. I mean, yeah. you and I were talking before we went on the air about Esau Macaulay's new book that's coming out. And I read that in order to blurb it in galleys. And it's the best thing he's written, I think. And that's really it's saying wonderful. something. So I'll yeah. let people know on my text threads, hey, keep an eye out yeah. for Esau Macaulay's new book because it's really good. Yes. Those sorts of yes. Things. You know, I think that's really fascinating too, because even thinking about the loss of place and just physical bookstores and the ways yeah. in which those shape us really is a great lead in to a lot of the books that you have been reading lately. Over the last quarter, you've been reading books, lots of them, but the ones that the five that we're going to kind of focus on today really engage questions of what does it mean to be human and what does it mean to be placed and limited and creaturely, as mm -hmm. well as where do we get these often desires to try to transcend the limits of our bodies? And how does that mess us up culturally? I'm going to ask a few questions for Russell every time. Why did you pick it up? What kept you reading? And what stuck with you? So if you are looking for a new read, you'll be able to hear a little bit about why Russell picked these books, what kept him engaged, and what also stuck with him. So our very first book that we're going to consider today is kind of a quirky collection of essays. It's called Escape into Meaning by Evan Pushak. If you are listening or watching, rather, on YouTube, you can get to see the the book titles here. But it's, it's Escape into Meaning. And he's the founder of NerdWriter. He, he makes his living on YouTube. And yet he's writing these sorts of essays that are quirky and fun and that are really engaging from a younger person's point of view about how we live in the world. So why'd you pick this one up, Russell? I was not familiar with this author. 
but he had, I think this is one that I found at a physical bookstore somewhere, if mm-hmm. I'm remembering right. And I just sort of, the title intrigued me. And then when I flipped it open, I noticed he had an essay on Tolkien and he had an essay on Superman. And mm-hmm. both of those things I love. And so I thought, well, this will be interesting. Mm-hmm. And I kind of looked around, looked around at a couple of paragraphs in each of those sections. And said, okay, he, he knows what he's talking about. So yep. I'm intrigued to see where, where <laughs> he comes good. down. He has a little bit. He got his street cred a little bit for you. What stuck with you in, in that book? On the one hand, it was that, that he really did know what he was writing about. I mean, there are a couple of things that I look for in something that I, that I know about. Mm-hmm. I kind of mm-hmm. look for typical cliches that people yeah. will say if it, if they don't know what they're talking about Mm -hmm. on that subject. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Nobody can know everything about everything, but it's a real tell. And so, for instance, this chapter on Superman, it's a real tell when you have somebody who will say, well, this is a boring character because he's Mm -hmm. invulnerable. And so it's very difficult to find situations where where there's genuine tension or threat. Well, anybody who actually knows this character knows that's not true at Mm -hmm. all because that's part of the problem is you have somebody who's trying to steward all this all this strength without hurting the mm-hmm. people that he loves and with the prospect of losing the people that he loves. And he he got this. He, he even wrote about that. And so I was intrigued by that. The Tolkien chapter I was intrigued by because he is one of these people and there are several of them. Neil Gaiman is this mm-hmm. way about Lewis and he's this way about Tolkien. He he loves Lord of the Rings books, but he kind of resents the Christian underpinning of that. Mm -hmm. And so he's giving kind of an unbelievers, I would, I would almost say it's a way of defending his love for Middle Earth. Right. Along with his rejection of Jerusalem, I guess is is what what you would say. And so that really kept me reading because I was engaging with it in my own Mm -hmm. mind, especially Mm -hmm. because His argument is, well, the reason that we resonate with Middle Earth and Narnia and other places is because we need to have meaning. I agree with Mm -hmm. that. And stories provide meaning. I agree with that. But in his view, that's all there is. The the stories are making the meaning and there's no there's no meaning behind it. Where there's no ultimate meaning, right? yeah, Yeah. Where what I argue is the reason that we love Subcreated stories is because we have a longing for meaning. And mm-hmm. so I see it more the way uh, Lewis did at the end of Surprised by Joy. The right. longing indicates there's an appetite, and the right. appetite points to something that is real. So I disagree with the way he saw it, but he argued his case uh, really well, and I enjoyed kind of mentally arguing with him. <laughs> That's great. And, you know, I think all books, right, become interactive too that yeah. way for us. And that it also really enlarges our sympathy and our understanding of completely different points of view. That's one, another thing that's really important about the breadth of your own reading, right, is that it allows you to kind of inhabit a whole different way of thinking and freshen up your own. Well, and even even when it doesn't give you sympathy, it can help you to think through your own convictions and Mm -hmm, your own mm -hmm, uh, point mm -hmm. of view. Because a lot of times I think, for instance, with this essay, I might ordinarily stand up and talk about why people resonate with, with the Lord of the Rings books. And I might talk about that narrative underpinning of reality and how we long for that. Well, this reminds me, okay, you have to engage with the people who will say, it's not that we read stories because we're mm-hmm. looking for meaning. We read mm-hmm. stories because there is no meaning and yeah. we're constructing it. So that gives you an extra step, right. even if you don't find yourself having sympathy or empathy with, right. with the author. Right. It helps engage the assumptions of your of your hearers yeah. before your, your readers. The next one is a, a piece of fiction called The Singularities by John Banville, winner mm-hmm. of the Booker Prize. 
And if you're watching on YouTube, it's a fantastic cover. But it is, yeah. <laughs> it's quite ominous looking. But I just was able to crack open the first few pages, and the narrator is fascinating and very fun. And I just appreciated being immersed right into this kind of quirky, weird obsessive really weird. voice. <laughs> yeah. I know that you're a huge fiction reader, that that's where you tend to go versus nonfiction. So how did you pick up the singularities? I don't know, but I'm not a, I'm not a longtime Banville uh, mm-hmm. reader or fan. And as I was reading this book, I wished that I were, because I think I would have had a completely different experience reading yeah. this book. Because one of the reasons that the book is so confusing is that you have these these characters who are, are showing up from nowhere and intersecting with one another, the, yeah. the narrator, you're like, wait a minute, where is this coming from? And it seems to yeah. be like a Greek god talking. And how is that fit with this? Right. Yeah. Well, it's what's like happening- on the second paragraph, right? Where he just kind of says like, who's talking? I am a god. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, yeah. what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If somebody else had written this a different way, I probably would have mm-hmm. said, I don't know what's going on here. And I would have right. just uh, put it away. But he draws you in. And the reason I say I wish that I had been a Banville reader mm-hmm. all along is because what he's doing is taking all of these characters from previous books that have nothing to do with each other and bringing them together in this yeah. story, which is even more important because the story is about this scientist who proves the existence of the multiverse and, mm-hmm. and what that does to. So if you were somebody who had been reading this all along, it would be kind of like the last live action Spider-Man movie mm-hmm. when the two previous right. Spider-Man actors yeah. Yeah. show up Spoiler alert. I guess I should have said that first, but it's been long <laughs> it's enough. Been you out should for know a while. this. Yeah. yeah. But when that happens, the and I saw it the opening day. So I was in mm-hmm. theater with people who it really the hadn't is unusual with movies. You really hadn't heard that this was happening yet. Mm-hmm. And the place just went wild because you're seeing yeah. all these streams coming together. That's what the book really mm-hmm. was. And it mm-hmm. was it was engaging with it. I think that's probably one reason why I kept with it is it's engaging with that same theme that we were just talking about of meaning. I mean, he keeps Mm -hmm. the kind of the central conceit is that after there's this discovery of the Brahma principle in which, how do I describe this, in which it's proven that observing something changes it. Mm -hmm. And so science then has been creating the world by observing it. And so scientists are now pulling back to, to stop from, from doing that. Mm-hmm. There's this question of, well, then, does anything mean anything? And, and that's not just mm-hmm. in the sort of the big scientific perspective, but in all of these characters' lives. That's what ultimately is being asked is, at the end of all this, was it all for nothing? Mm-hmm. That's the central question. And, and of yeah. course, I think that's the central question in everybody's Mm -hmm. life, whether they want to face it or not. And it's so important to engage these questions, not just, you know, in a sort of philosophical treatise, right? Mm -hmm. But in fiction, you can get immersed into that question in quite a different way. Yeah. And and you can see the way that different personalities engage with Mm -hmm. that question in in Mm -hmm. completely different ways, just just like they do in real life. You have some people who engage with the question by just sort of distracting themselves and diverting themselves Mm -hmm. in various ways. And other people who are kind of wrecked by it, you know, and and it, Mm -hmm. it kind of shows you these categories that you you see, but you don't really know that you see with the people mm-hmm. you're you're mm-hmm. talking to. And I think all good writing, especially fiction writing, really helps us to to see and to visualize and kind of name something, right, that we didn't have a name for. And it, it immerses us in a different way, right, than nonfiction saying, here, here's your definition. This is how you should understand this sort of thing. Yeah. There are also in this book, there are so many lines that are alone, really mm-hmm. powerful, mm-hmm. It, really similar to Marilyn Robinson in Mm -hmm. this way. But Mm -hmm. he'll say things like, and it's, you know, I don't usually remember. It's hard for me to remember what did I read here as opposed to somewhere else. But he wrote in here, even a nihilist believes in the nothing. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and that that sort of thing it, that's just kind of offhand in the text, yeah, but it yeah. sticks with you. I can't wait to read it further. And so our next step, and again, it's fun to see just kind of thematically tied together. The next book you read was an issue of social commentary, but it kind of questions of meaning making and transhumanism come up. Uh, we're going to talk next about the survival of the richest. Mm-hmm. The Escape Fantasies of the Tech Billionaires by Douglas Rushkoff. And if you haven't listened, we did have a transhumanism episode earlier, so we'll be sure to link that in the show notes. But, you know, what was it about this book that kind of grabbed you initially, Russell? I think because I had written about this phenomenon a little bit earlier Mm -hmm. on the somebody who called them arc heads, this kind of arc mentality of using Mm -hmm. the imagery of of Mm -hmm. Noah of building something that can withstand cataclysm. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's really what this book is about, but it's in different ways. It's talking about these tech billionaires who really, if you listen to them, Mm -hmm. have a really dystopian view of the world and a utopian view of themselves. Mm -hmm. And so it's a, there's really bad disaster coming. Mm-hmm. And they see different sorts of disasters. Some of them is climate change. For some of them, it's uh, artificial intelligence going badly, other things. And they're trying to find some way to get away from that through, you know, Elon Musk wanting to colonize right. Mars and the moon to Ray Kurzweil and people like that who are wanting to download their consciousness onto a cloud and to escape death to people who are wanting to really perfect the metaverse in such Mm -hmm. a way that they can have an alternative place to live. All of those things, it's kind of, it reminded me a lot as a kid who grew up in a Bible Belt dispensationalist church Mm -hmm. with a lot of talk about the rapture. Yeah. It really has that vibe, just secularized. Yeah. This is sort of the left behind tech bro uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Rushkoff talks about it as like this, quote unquote, the mindset, right? And that yeah. what's what's fascinating about what he calls, you know, the mindset is he says at one point that it's divorced from any sort of collective identity. So there's this sense, right, where Jeff Bezos is saying, thank you so much for buying all these Amazon packages so that I can succeed, right? Rather than Mm -hmm. any sort of sense of of collective um, identity. One thing that's really fascinating in this book is he talks about the political moment that we're in and what does it look like when we have lost this communal identity and kind of live in this tech billionaire world. And he writes this, we've never seen a society avoid fascism when it gets to this stage of economic inequality or a civilization avoid collapse when it has taxed its physical environment to this extent. That's a big statement. Tell us what you think about that, Russell. Well, I mean, I don't remember if it was in this book or or in another, but there was a discussion about income inequality. Yeah. And there was this I think uh, it was re- in this one. It was in this one. This mm-hmm. repudiation of of what would one would naturally say, I mean, w- this is the greatest economic period in the history of the world. Mm-hmm. I mean, we have a, a level of, of living and technological advancement that of things we just take for granted that even, even the poorest people have. And so how can you say that this is a period of economic uh, collapse? But the point is with income inequality is it's not what you have, it's what you're comparing yourself to. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I think about this all the time. Uh, mm-hmm. Tom Nichols was on, I think, on the bulletin with us or maybe it was somewhere else. He was talking about how growing up as a kid in working class Rhode Island or Massachusetts, that he never was in a home that was that much nicer than mm-hmm. his. There mm-hmm. were some that were nicer, but he wasn't in one. In some, And so we kind of had a we're all we're all kind of in this together now. When you have people can go on Zillow and look at all kinds of things or they can watch. My son has gotten into watching these pool construction uh, (laughs) shows, which I didn't even know existed. 
but it's about people who come in and do a and construct these luxury pools in people's yards. And uh-huh. he, he, my son said, if I were somebody who played a drinking game, yeah. I could do that with the word grotto on this show. <laughs> <laughs> That's hysterical. <laughs> Raised all kinds of questions. <laughs> right, but yeah. you can see those kinds of things, and that creates an even greater distance and a sense of deprivation, even right. when there's not one. And I mm-hmm. found that to be a compelling argument. You know, and I think there's the idea behind it, too. He writes in the end of the book about the importance of actually finding our identities through community. What I think happens with poverty, especially now is that poverty is inherently isolating in this mm-hmm. in this kind of society. That wouldn't have been the case, for instance, in the Great Depression. When I would, my grandparents were Depression era mm-hmm. kids. And what they would talk about in terms of the way that everybody sort of saw, this is a crisis. All of us are, are in the same situation. Uh, you know, nobody was hanging out with Rockefellers Mm -hmm. and they're Mm -hmm. all, you know, kind of moving in together when somebody lost their house and and so forth. Now you look around and Mm -hmm. you see whether you're talking about urban or rural, all of these categories, there's a sense in which poverty is pulling people away from each other in a way in which I think there's a sense right now culturally of personal failure that Mm -hmm. is associated with a lack of economic status that it, that just isn't mm-hmm. rooted in mm-hmm. reality, but there's mm-hmm. that cultural sense. And so you have people who kind of withdraw. I've seen this a lot of people who mm-hmm. actually, it's kind of shame that yeah. they kind of start to withdraw in shame, even though they don't have anything to be ashamed of <laughs> and start to then find ways to, to numb that in a lot of cases, not in every case, yeah. but in a lot of cases. And that's, that's, that's a, Different. It's not that it's necessarily a different economic time, but it's a very different cultural approach to the economics. Yeah, right. That rather than when we experience hardship or suffering, that we actually then are are oriented towards one another, expecting our neighbors to be neighborly. Yeah, rather and, than and, something and there different. are some exceptions to that. I mean, for instance, a lot of people talk about and complain about. Oh, these these kids who are who are staying in their parents' basements and all that mm-hmm. uh, sort of stuff, and and sometimes that is because of perpetual adolescence or or what <laughs> right, have you. Right. But I've seen it a lot more lately, far more in terms of families that I've got a, I've got a really close friend, couple. They had their their daughter and son in law come stay with them over the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And they had a baby and it just worked and it was good for everybody involved. And when they moved away, my friends were really sad. I mean, it wasn't Mm -hmm. like, oh, we finally got these (laughs) kids out of it. They were really sad. And Mm -hmm. And I realized it's because they actually were experiencing the way most human lives have been lived up until Mm -hmm. the the modern era. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. we have lost something with that being gone. I think I read something recently or heard something saying that actually in new housing across the United States, there's more and more of the sense of having, you know, like the mother-in-law unit or that we're moving back to multi-generational households. Yes, I I heard that too. And I can't remember where that was. Maybe it was on one of of your shows. It may have been. It (laughs) may have been. Yeah. Yeah. But I I talked about that at the dinner table here and one of my sons just starts looking up at the ceiling and I said, what? And he said, oh, I'm just trying to imagine what we're going to do with your books. <laughs> you would we have to move you in. Yeah. 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 I will tell you, a bunch of my books are just still in the garage, even in our own house. So yeah. there you go. <laughs> yeah. Well, the fourth book that you kind of highlighted in this last quarter is a book, a historical book called God With Us, Lived Theology and the Freedom Struggle in Americus, Georgia, 1942 to 1976. So it's interesting because, you know, Rushkoff, the last book we talked about, kind of writes about the black community as a great example of communal identity and antidote to some of that kind of tech billionaire individualism. How has this book informed your thinking? I got this book because it it deals a lot with someone who's a hero of mine, Clarence Jordan Mm -hmm. from America's Georgia, who's a, a fellow proud alum of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. 
although he's of a several generations back. Mm-hmm. And he's somebody that, for whatever reason, I mean, I've always admired him. And for whatever reason, lately, I keep finding myself with people who knew him. I mean, mm-hmm. even though he died in the what, the early 70s, I think. Yeah. But a lot of people who knew him or who worked with him and hearing a lot of these these stories about Koinonia Farms, which mm-hmm. was a an interracial farm in South Georgia that created all of this hostility from mm-hmm. the rest of the community. This book's about him. And that's, that's why I picked it up. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. then it goes on to talk about there are different sections, one on the African-American community in Americas and what was going on there during these years of Jim Crow and how they were engaging with the broader civil rights movement all the way through to the reason it goes to 1976 is because it deals with the emergence of Jimmy Carter, mm-hmm. uh, who, of course, is in Plains, just right out from Americas, and who had to deal with his church. There are several church, several white churches talked about in this book that had to answer the question of what they were going to do about segregation. And Carter's church voted to remain segregated, not to receive African American worshipers. The Carters voted against that, but that's what the church decided to do. And so it's all of this, mm. and a lot of it is really resonant and feels really immediate because Mm -hmm. it's family estrangement. It's churches that are justifying what they're doing in terms of their theology, including Ku Klux Klan and and those sorts of things. But it's got these heroic figures that are there. Mm -hmm. I mean, for instance, Jordan, who was... um, overall wearing farmer, even though he was a New Testament PhD. Mm-hmm. And one of the Klansmen came and said, you're going you're gonna to end this project. And the big problem for them was not the farm. It was the mm-hmm. fact that you had black people and white people eating together. And they were intentionally trying to replicate the book of Acts. Mm-hmm. And they said, you're going to stop this. And if you're not, people who do this are not going to see sundown. And, and Jordan responded, well, you know, I'm a Southern Seminary grad and I've heard about people who could command the sun to be still in the sky, <laughs> yeah. but I've never met one. <laughs> and would sort of Cute. use humor in order to yeah, engage with yeah. these folks. It's a really, it, it feels sadly, I think in many ways, really close. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like it gave you any sort of pathway looking back for our current moment? Well, between this book and there's a, a plow did a little collection Mm -hmm. of Jordan uh, sermons, Mm -hmm. and the same person who edited that did a fantastic biography of Jordan. It gave a path forward just with seeing some of these people who didn't give up, even though Mm -hmm. they would have every earthly reason just to Mm -hmm. say, this this is never going to go anywhere. And so that is, I, I think, one of the key insights. Examples of hope. Yeah. Being faithful. Well, it sounds a bit, you know, Jordan, as you were talking about, as the New Testament PhD with his overalls, sounds a little bit like uh, Wendell Berry, mm-hmm. which brings us to mm-hmm. our next our next book. You read a collection of his essays. It all turns on affection, the Jefferson Lecture and other essays by Wendell Berry, one of your heroes. So it'll be fun just to chat a little bit about I guess I know. You picked it up because it's Barry, right? But. Well, this was a rereading. <laughs> I mean, I've read this book, I don't know how many times, but right. I picked it up again this time because I had been having this conversation with somebody mm-hmm. about the difference between statistical knowledge and mm. and personal knowledge and mm-hmm. the, the fact that mm. that knowledge isn't just sort of chat GPT facts. Uh, right. laid out, that it requires imagination and imagination mm-hmm. requires affection. And so I was I was wanting to quote something that yes. Mr. Barry said in this book. So I took it back down and then I found myself flipping around at my highlights and rereading them. And before I knew it, I sat down and I'd, I'd reread the book. Yeah, yeah. Uh, It's a short little book. So it's a short little that. book, in there, yep. but there's a lot of there's a lot of insight in there. What I really loved about that Jefferson lecture, he talks about, you know, these idea from Wallace Stegner, another fantastic writer, but Mm -hmm. he writes about this idea of boomers, not as the generation, but those who want 
this level of, of comfort. They want to move away and stickers, right? Those yeah. who are going to care for a place. And he talks about, you know, that there's the problem is with these two groups of people is that there's a failure of imagination and imagination tunes the affections, which is a helpful way to kind of rethink maybe or deepen, right? Some of that Augustine question about our hearts are restless until they rest in God. That what does it look like to stir the affections? Yeah. And I think too, it's, I think there's this mentality that says that real thinking is mm. cognition and right. imagination is the escape from thinking. Mm-hmm. And so it's mm-hmm. the, it's the opposite. Right. You're in an imaginary story world, you know, sort of right, thing we right. might say to somebody. And that's not true. It's that sort of computer data collection kind of thinking actually isn't knowledge. Right. It's one component of it, but mm-hmm. you don't. And that that's his point. And of course, his his primary concern is the land and the, the connection right. with the land. But I think it applies beyond that. You really I would apply it to the Bible. Mm-hmm. You don't really know the Bible if you're just a sort of concordance. And I have that on my mind, I guess, because my wife came in yesterday or the day before and said, hey, do you have a concordance? And I said, no. And she said, (laughs) are you kidding? You've got 10,000 books right here. And I said, yeah, but it's been so long since I've needed a concordance when you can do searchable stuff. I mean, who (laughs) who still has one? But there's a a way in which you can be kind Mm -hmm. of a Bible program. You know how to search through everything or you know all the data, but you don't actually know it. Right. Because you you don't know what it means to be personally addressed by it mm-hmm. and to have what Jesus talks about, those who seek will find. There's a, a certain kind of longing and love and imagination that's required mm-hmm. before the revelation happens. Mm-hmm. And so I think that it really applies to that, to personal Bible reading, mm-hmm. to the way that we teach the Bible in small groups or other places, that's really relevant to this, I think. Yeah. For those of us who might be stuck in this idea of, I know God by download of a bunch of facts, right? A bunch of information. Mm -hmm. How do we help folks begin to open up those little imaginative corners of their brain and their mind and their hearts uh, to engage with scripture, particularly maybe as an example, more imaginatively so that it kind of gets in our bones, right? The same yeah. way music might. Well, I normally come at it indirectly. Mm-hmm. And what I try to do is to find a place that somebody actually does connect through imagination and affection. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. There, there almost always is a place like that. They just mm-hmm. don't know that they can connect to God's word that way. And so what I try to do is to find what that is and show them how they're responding to that mm. and then teach them how to apply. I know that's people who have taught me stuff. That's how that's what works is mm-hmm. they come in and say, wait, you actually do know how to do this. You just don't know that you know how to do it. But mm-hmm. if you can just do what you're doing here mm-hmm. and uh, and expand on that in this way and apply it over here. That just is an easier way for me to learn something than to think, okay, I've got to, from point zero, come up with this entirely new way of doing or knowing or being, Mm -hmm. when usually that's really not the case. So it's kind of Acts 17. Paul comes Mm -hmm. in and says, you say you don't know what I'm talking about, but you actually do. Yeah. Yeah. And so find those places. That's really helpful. Yeah. You know, I've been thinking a lot about how you actually do that. Mike Cosper and I are going to be leading a writing workshop in October. And so we're mm-hmm. thinking a lot about how do you write actually to stir stir the heart, to stir the affections. But it requires a lot of vulnerability too and a lot of really good fictional sorts of moments, right? Where you're able to zero in on the concrete detail as well to put us in place. Yeah, and it, it kind of brings me back to that first book, Escape into Meaning, that we talked about, because he talks about in there something that I think is absolutely true, which is you don't think first and then express. Yeah. That almost never happens. You instead think through expressing. Mm -hmm. And for some people, 
you know, that works out in different ways for different people. For some people, that's through writing. Mm -hmm. For for me, it's either through writing or teaching. Mm -hmm. And so I don't, I'm teaching through Exodus right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't engage with Exodus and then go out and teach it. As I'm teaching it, I'm learning Exodus. And that's one of the reasons why I do a weekly newsletter is Mm -hmm. because I force myself to sit down and write about something. I rarely know what I'm, what I think about something until I actually write about it and engage with it. And so the newsletter is really, it's kind of a hack for me to force me into thinking. And if I can't trick myself into doing that, because you could say, well, why don't you just write write it out? I can't do that. I've got to have people who are going to say, well, it's Thursday. Where's where's this? If I know right. that, that yep. forces me to express something. And that's how I grapple with it and think things through. And yes. you know, for a lot of people, it's not writing, but it's, it's some other way of doing right. that. And I think that's just a, a mm-hmm. really important principle. Yeah. Even in conversation, right? Mm-hmm. Scheduling a walk with a friend and talk about the scripture passage you're, you've been reading, right? Those are ways that we very practically in very small ways. You don't have to be a writer, but it is helpful to process in community, which yeah. again, seems yet another theme of, of, our, of our time. And well, it takes a yeah. specific kind of giftedness to, I've been in awkward sort of dinner table. Okay, mm-hmm. here are the things we're going to discuss. And uh-huh. it's like, oh. But there's a particular kind of gifted Mm. person who knows how to do that, Mm -hmm. but in a sneaky kind of way where you don't actually know that that's what they're doing until later. You say, okay, somebody's (laughs) guiding us through these conversations, (laughs) but we just thought we were just having a conversation. Right. Which is the best way to learn. Yeah. Well, don't forget, you can always send us your reading list, Russell also publishes, you know, Desert Island Playlist and Desert Island Reading Lists in his newsletter. You can email those 10 to 12 books that you'd take with you if you were stranded on a desert island to questions at russellmore.com. So thanks, Russell. And as we end, tell us what's at the top of your to-be-read list going forward towards the end of the year at the moment. You know, that is such a a hard question for me, for whatever reason, the minute that somebody asks me, yeah. what are you reading or what are you wanting to <sighs> yeah. read? It yeah. just disappears uh, right. from me. But okay. I'm reading some kind of creepy things right now, uh, <laughs> which I think might surprise people, but not mm-hmm. not gory horror stuff, mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. just some creepy things that I kind of down in this case I downloaded in order to read while I uh-huh. was on vacation and still have some of them to read. So right. you t- it's just that feels fitting for fall, right? You need something a yeah. little dark. Thank you again as always to share your books at length a bit with your listeners. It's always a pleasure to talk about your reading and the themes that it brings up. Appreciate it. Thanks, you. Ashley. The Russell Moore Show is a production of Christianity Today. Executive producers are Eric Petrick, Russell Moore, and Mike Cosper. Host, Russell Moore. Producer, Ashley Hales. Associate producers, Abby Perry and Azure Phelps. Director of Operations for CT Media is Matt Stevens. Audio engineering is provided by Dan Phelps. Our video producer is Abby Egan. And the theme song for The Russell Moore Show is Dusty Delta Day by Lennon Petty.